Um, lovely. Thank you very much for coming to my talk when you could be at Juliet's talk, which is also really interesting. We're going to be talking about the bit of your application that doesn't get talked about very much. It's very, very easy to talk about the other bits of applications. And I'm, talking to talk, I'm going to talk to you today about the business logic. The bit of your application that is the model. I think this is the hardest part of your application to write because you get the least amount of support. You get a lot of support for the controller section of a MVC application. We're all using the framework. Hands up if you're using the framework. So Laravel, Slim, Zen Framework, Symfony, something like that. Yeah, pretty much all of us are using a framework. That gives you a controller out of the box. Makes it very easy to get the routing of your application working. Gives you a view layer. So you're using a templating language probably, or you're using PHP directly, but the view side of an application is very well understood. You're using plates, you're using Twig, you're using whatever Laravel's um, view layer is. We know how to write the view of an application. We know how to output HTML. We know how to secure our variables. That's all nicely handled. What about the model? What do we get for the model? You think, Laravel, any Laravel people here using Laravel? OK, so when I say model, you probably think eloquent. Symphony users here? You're probably thinking doctrine. That's not your model. That is your database persistence library. Your model is the actual application that's doing the work. That bit there is the hard bit. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is something called DDD, Domain Driven Design. It's an approach to helping you manage the model, managing the code in your model, because this part of your application is the valuable bit. This is the bit that makes your application unique. It's the bit that makes money for your company or for yourself. Domain Driven Design is a book by someone called Eric Evans. Um, has anyone read this book? No, a few of you, cool. Um, it was written by an academic person. It is extremely boring to read. That's a problem with academic papers. Um, have you all heard of RESTful APIs? RESTful APIs? Right. The RESTful API idea came from a dissertation by someone called Roy Fielding. And again, it's quite a boring article to read. So we're going to explore what's in there in hopefully a more accessible manner, a way that will make it more useful to you. So we're going to have to unpack some terminology. Um, there's an awful lot of terminology in DDD and Domain Driven Design. There's a lot of terminology in all of programming. You've probably noticed this. The reason we have a lot of terminology is because we can share what we're saying with less words. So when I use a term, I only have to say one word, and you all understand the context that I mean. So when we come to domain, this is one of those words. It has a particular meaning, so that when I say the word domain, you will all know what I mean. And what I mean by domain is the real world subject space. What is the problem we are trying to solve in the real world? What is the words, the problem space, the business um, issues that our customers have, our clients have, our users have? That is the domain, the problem space itself. And then we have another word called model. A model is an abstraction, an implementation of a domain in software. So it's a simplification, because we can't create the whole world inside our application. That doesn't make sense. We pull in the bits that are relevant to create a successful application, and that is our model. So the phrase model with a lowercase m is a representation in software of a real world problem. To define the model, we have to work out what the domain is. And the way we do that is by 
diagrams, it's by use cases, it's by specifications. These are all very non-software things. They're all very touchy-feely to a certain extent. And that's what the key thing is about your domain level design. It's all about communication and it's all about writing things down that are not necessarily in your software. Before I go any further, DDD is a fairly complicated subject. There's a lot to it. There's a lot of work involved with it. And it might not be the right choice for every single application. So it is a tool within your toolbox. It is not necessarily the use case every single time. You get a lot of benefits from DDD. You get the ability to create a useful description of the problem space that you are solving. You get the ability to collaborate with your clients and with the business people. So if you're writing enterprise type software or software where you have a product owner, so if you're in the agile world, then good collaboration is a requirement for DDD and a benefit of DDD. You will get a far better user experience with software that has been designed with DDD in mind because you understand the problems that the users have, the solutions they are trying to achieve, and you can build your software to meet those goals much, much better. And as a result of that understanding, you also get better architecture and you get more flexible architecture. So if your app is going to be around for a long while, then modeling approaches like DDD make a lot of sense. If your app is for a marketing campaign that's going to last for six weeks, then arguably this would be the wrong choice. You'll spend a lot of time doing things that will be meaningless. And the same thing for small applications. If you can fit the entirety of your application into your head, then you possibly don't need DDD. Most of us work on software that's more complicated than that. Most of us work on software that is too big to fit in our head all the time. We look at source code and can't remember why we wrote it. That's the world we live in. We write complicated applications now. So strategies to help us understand our code is important. DDD is really good at that. This is a quote from Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde was a UK um, person. He lived in England. We have everything in common with America nowadays, except, of course, language. Now, I'm English. I speak with a British accent. And I've noticed that I've been in Turkey, that all the people speaking English to me are speaking American English to me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> what can you do? Um, it's a very similar language to English. So you use English, obviously, and American English. So, um, American English is very similar to British English, but not quite the same. There are terms that you use that I have to translate in my head, and we speak in the same language. And that's even before we get to a proper different language. The same can be said between you as a developer and your client, your business people, your analysts. They are using the same words that you would use, but they are thinking something slightly different. So you think you're having the conversation about the same thing, but you're actually talking at cross purposes ever so slightly. That's really, really common. Has anyone come across this before? Are you using a word and someone else using the same word, but not in quite the same context? And DDD has a name for this. We call it ubiquitous language. We have to come up with a way to ensure that when I say a word within the problem space, everyone on the team understands the same thing. You will almost certainly write the wrong software if you do not have a common language. And this is most noticeable when you get to testing. So you write your whole application, and then the user goes, it doesn't work like I thought it would. And the user says that because they had a different idea of what you meant when you used the words that you said. So we need to get people on the same page. 
Let's have a common language. We call this ubiquitous language. It describes the business problem by the business's point of view. So I do a lot of work in the insurance industry. Um, I don't know how I ended up there, but I'm apparently reasonably good at it because people pay me. I like being paid, so I do more insurance work. There's lots of words in the insurance industry. There are things like policies. There are things like renewals. There are things like risks. There are things like underwriters. And I had an idea in my mind what an insurance policy was. I buy car insurance. I buy travel insurance. I know what an insurance policy is. I haven't got a clue. The people of my client, they know what a policy is from their point of view. I had to readjust my meanings to be their meanings, so that when I say the word policy, everyone agrees on the terminology. That's what ubiquitous language is all about. Creating your ubiquitous language, actually understanding the words that the business people use, requires conversations, requires talking to people. In the Q&A section with Rasmus's talk, he said something along the lines of that software developers aren't particularly social. We're not well known as gregarious people. Software people are really good at talking in terms of communication. We are remarkably good at it. We just don't think we are. Get over this. You have the ability to talk to people in a technical manner to understand what they're trying to tell you. And you can do this. The best way to understand a business problem is to talk to a business person. The easiest way to understand what a user requires from your software is go and talk to the user. It's worth doing. This is the way you do it. You find out what they expect your software to do. You find out what they expect the output to be. You write it down. One of the best ways to write it down is something called use cases or user stories, or user journeys. We invent personas that represent the users of our software. And we write down how they expect to use our software. That is creating a ubiquitous language which makes life much, much easier. Some more terminology. These ones are complicated. Bounded contexts, or context maps. This is starting to get a bit theoretical. But the key thing we care about here is that when we agree a word that rep for something in our software, it only has to work within that particular part of the software. So when I define what a, I don't know, a press release represents in my particular application, it only has to mean that for my software. And the bounded context limits the area that I'm writing my software for and most usefully comes in with microservices. So if you're writing microservices, then you're dividing your application up into different sections, and then each section is its own service that you can deploy independently. The key thing about bounded context is that you don't split important business logic across a microservice boundary, or across an API boundary, or across a software boundary of some form or another because it makes it much harder to maintain. So that's something to be aware of. Divide your application up in a way that it makes sense for maintenance. That's the key thing. If two things are separate as far as the business people are concerned, they should be separate in your software. Do not couple them together. That's some theory. Let's put it into some practice. Here's some things that I think belong in a model. We've got things like our business rules, our validation rules. Um, what else have we got? Sending emails. You need to send an email. That's part of your model. Things like value objects, database storage. We talked about using Eloquent or Doctrine. That is part of your model layer, so it needs to be handled correctly. There's lots of different things up there. We can do something better than that. We can organize it into layers, that things that are common together. 
So authentication, application logic, and sending emails are all the same sort of thing. Our business rules, our value objects, our entities, they're all the same sort of thing. So we group these things together into layers, and we can talk about them and understand what's going on between them, and we can avoid coupling between the layers where possible. So let's take an example that we're going to run through for the rest of the talk. Does everyone recognize this map? Possibly not. This is a railway map. It's one of the oldest railway maps in the world that was invented for customers, for travelers. It comes from the London Underground. And the point of this map, which was invented in 1933, was to enable a traveler to work out how to get from one station to another station in terms of the train lines rather than in terms of the geography. So the key thing that this particular map did was it ignored geography. The train lines are not straight lines in the real world because that's not how the real world works. But as a traveler, I don't care. I just care that I can get from so Notting Hill Gate to Chancery Lane by going down the red line. And it's just 10 stops down the line or whatever. It's a way to plan a journey in a very easy way. And I would guess that your metro lines in Istanbul have got very similar maps. It's a very easy map to understand. How would you model this in the real world or in our software? First thing we do is we have to identify the key objects in our problem space. This is where we talk to our customer, we talk to the people who are going to be using our software, what are the words they use? And we come up with some obvious ones. We have customers, we have journeys, we've got stations, we've got the railway line. These, line, these words come together and then we draw a picture where we relate the key objects together. So I can say that a customer has many journeys. A journey has a start and it has an end. You see this is a really nice diagram? That's because I'm giving you a presentation. In the real world, my diagrams don't look like that. I get a piece of paper, I use a pen. You wouldn't be able to read it because I'm not a good drawer. But you just need to draw the relationships between your key objects so that you understand them. It doesn't have to be super pretty. It doesn't have to be all the correct shapes. You just have to understand how it works. Your entities are the things in your problem space. They are the nouns. They mean something to a customer. So a station or a, um, a user, a press release, a pol insurance policy. These are all entities. They have state and they are mutable. What I mean by mutable is that they change over time in your software. You persist them. So entities get saved to your database or to your data store of whatever form you are using. And they have life cycles. They change over time. The key thing there is that an entity is identified by its identity. Identity means that it has a unique instance of itself. We have many stations, each is unique. How do we define the identity of our entities is quite important. There are two levels that we need to do this at. We need to do this once for the customer. And we need to do it once for our data store. So it's really, really tempting to assume that your customer cares about your database IDs. Your customer does not care about your database IDs, ever. So if you're going to write a fairly normal website, you've probably got users that log in. Most people have got a website with users. None of your users care what ID they are. Hands up if you know your Twitter ID. No one has raised their hands. What kind of people are you? Hands up if you know your Twitter username. If you've got a Twitter account, you know your Twitter username. That is the identity for the Twitter user object. 
It's not the ID that they store it into the database with, which is a good job because they have to keep changing it. It gets too big and didn't fit in the space anymore. So this is a key thing. Identity is what the customer, the user, the business people think for that object as much as it is your database persistence. Be aware of that and talk about these objects in the phraseology that the customer or the business people or your analyst expect. So in terms of stations, we would talk about the name of the station. And you've got concept of value objects. Value objects always come up in DDD world. Value objects are lovely. I really like value objects because they're immutable. Immutable means that they do not change once you've created it. And do you know what the really nice thing about an object that does not change once you've created it is? You can test it and trust it. They are so trustworthy. Value objects are lovely. They are very easy to trust, but they have no state. They have no life cycle. So you have to be aware that they're not useful for everything. Key thing about them is they do not have identity. So here's a quote from Wikipedia, which is the source of all truth. When people exchange dollar bills, they generally do not distinguish between each unique bill. They are only concerned about the face value of the dollar bill. In this context, dollar bills are value objects. So if I've got a 50 lira note, and I give you a 50 lira note, and you give me back a 50 lira note, I think I have got my 50 lira back. I don't care if it is the same note or if it's a different note, it means the same amount to me. That's a value object. The banks, however, the Federal Reserve, because Wikipedia is very American-centric. However, the Federal Reserve is concerned about each unique bill. In this context, the bill is an entity. So from the Federal Reserve's point of view, this particular dollar bill, this particular dollar bill are different. And they care about the fact that they have two that have unique numbers. They become entities at that point, and the dollar bill, the note, becomes, has a life cycle. It is printed, it goes into circulation, it is withdrawn from circulation. It is an entity as far as the bank is concerned. For us, we just want to spend the money or receive the money. Aggregates is a term you'll come across if you ever read up on this stuff. It simply means a set of entities that work together. It turns out that business problems are complicated and you end up needing more than one thing. Even something simple like a blog is more complicated than just a single entity. So you have a blog with comments and with tags and categories. We group all that together and we call it an aggregate. You can't save a blog article inside WordPress without setting a category. Therefore, we have a category, we have a blog article. The combination of the two is an aggregate. Throw an example of that um, value object out there. Let's look at a station. So a station has a location. So we've got a name, we've got East Inns and North Inns are the phrase we use for its X and Y position on a map. Has opening hours. I can extract the East in and the North in, the X and the Y, into its own object. And I do that because you can't have one without the other. You can't have a location on a map without knowing the X coordinate and the Y coordinate. So we group them together and we have a value object. It has no identity, it has no ID. That's all a value object is. And that's it. You can now organize all your things, all your objects, all your nouns, all your entities quite easily in your software in ways that are fairly testable. Then we come to domain services. This is the doing. I talked about objects having life cycles. So you start with a user, a user gets registered, a user does stuff, places orders, makes tweets, whatever it might do. User does stuff, it has a life cycle. Where do we put the code that manages that life cycle and does the work? We put it in a domain service. 
So what we're doing here is we're mapping the processes to source code. A domain service is a separate class from your entities. It represents a behavior. So if I take up an insurance policy to put it under cover, the process of taking up an insurance policy is a service in my model domain. Generally, they don't have internal state, which makes them, again, quite easy to test. If you start having to save to database something, you have an entity, not a service. Generally, more than one actor is in play. We tend to have more than one object being manipulated as part of our domain service. These are the conditions involved. You've got to do calculations that require multiple inputs. So routing, you know, do it, planning a journey is a good example of a domain service. A significant business process, um, taking insurance policy up under Taking an insurance policy undercover is a really good example of a fairly significant process. It belongs in a service. Translating an object to another type of object is another type of service. They're all doing things. When your code is doing stuff, it becomes a service. So let's look at some code that does that. So here we have a journey. It's a simple entity. We've got a start station, we have an end station, and we have the ability to work out how to get from one station to another station. We route from the start to the end. Has anyone written a class that looks something like that before? You can put your hand up, because this is my class. I've written a class like this before. Lots of really, really common code that looks something like this, where we have a load of getters and setters, and then we write a service. Here's our routing service. It does the routing for us. It takes the start station, it takes the end station, and it returns the route. So it plans the journey. We've just invented an anti-pattern. I've written loads of code like this. I do it all the time. And it's called the anemic domain model. What I have done is I've made my class very, very unintelligent. Although I'm talking about DDD today, object-oriented programming is still important. And one of the key things about object-oriented programming is that an object has state, has properties, and an object has behavior, it has methods. There is no behavior in that class. It's not a very good object-oriented design. We call that the anemic domain model. You will discover that you have got lots of these in your source code because it's really, really easy to create them. Because what happens is that you take a database table and you create a class from your database table. And what's in your class that's from your database table? A load of getters and setters and maybe a save method. It's a really, really common thing to do. It's important to add your domain behavior to your entities when it is solely that entity's responsibility. So my journey should know how to route itself. It doesn't need a separate class to do so. Okay, so let's talk about persistence. You can't talk about the model layer without talking about persistence. What do I mean by persistence? I mean storing to databases. Although I say databases, I could also mean um, CouchDB, you know, the NoSQL databases, document databases. I don't necessarily mean relational databases, though I suspect most of us are using relational databases. There are multiple ways to store to a database. If it's a nice, simple model, use a table data gateway or a data mapper. If it's a complex model, you will have to use a data mapper or you will have to use an ORM, an object relational mapper. If you are using an aggregate, i.e. you have multiple objects that must be saved together, 
you must use an ORM, otherwise you will end up with inconsistencies. Pick the right one for your particular set of problems. It's fairly common in a fairly big application to use different persistence models for different objects within it. Try not to just use the same hammer, tempting though it might be. It's not always the right one. I don't particularly care which one you use, except do not use the active record pattern ever. The problem with the active record pattern is that it couples your domain logic to your database. Coupling is the worst thing you can do in your application. The tighter your coupling, the harder it is to maintain, the more complicated and expensive it is to change. If something is complicated to change, what happens? You don't change it. Now you get pissed off people. People get unhappy. You can't change the code as easily as you would like to be able to change it. Hence, you start lagging. And we have a name for this. We call it technical debt. If you look at technical debt, 90% of it is because you coupled too closely together. Active record is the quintessential problem where this happens, where your properties in your database, all the column names in your database, are the same names as they are in your entities and are the same names as are in your form fields or in your uh, JSON representations in your API. You've coupled everything together and now someone needs to change some behavior in the middle. And it's difficult. Be very, very, very careful of coupling. That was a slight rant. I didn't mean to do that. Table Data Gateway is the easiest way to do database persistence. This is an active record without the active bit, basically. It's very, very simple. It operates on a single database table. You put all the SQL that deals with saving to a database table in a class. That's it. Looks something like that. You have some sort of class. This is a journey gateway, so it saves journeys. We have find methods. We have insert methods. We have update methods. And you're thinking, yeah, this looks a bit like an active record. The key thing is it returns the data. It doesn't store the data back into itself. That's the only difference between this and an active record. So they're quite easy to write. They're quite easy to use. It is quite easy to use um, things like Eloquent in this mode. Data Mapper is a class that translates the columns from one style in your database to the type of objects that you have. So you are separating out far more cleanly where your objects are and where your database persistence is. It's a good isolation method. It is really, really common, and it provides some maximum amount of flexibility. If you're using Doctrine, you're using a data mapper, because that's what it does behind the scenes for you, which makes it really, really helpful. Data mappers look basically the same. We still have find methods. We still have. Um, well, we have a save method now, rather than insert and update, because we've got slightly more intelligence inside our data mapper. Our data mapper cares about the objects. It takes a journey object and knows how to save it for us. We don't have to care about which database tables it goes into. ORMs do exactly the same thing as a data mapper, except they work with an object graph. When I say an object graph, that is just a complicated way of saying a group of objects. You've got more than one object in play, you have an object graph, and ORM is able to save your object graph for you. And again, Doctrine is really good at this. Eloquent's not bad at it either. If you're using aggregates, you must use an ORM, and do not ever write your own. I assume we're past that stage now, aren't we? We don't have to write all our own source code. A composer exists for a reason. Let other people write the code. So yeah, it's an ORM. Persistence layer is a bit more complicated. 
This is why you don't write it yourself. You get things like the unit of work um, design pattern involved at this point, where the ORM knows which objects that you have loaded can then be saved again. So you don't have to manage any of the life cycles yourself. Very, very powerful code. It can appear bloated. You hear this criticism of a doctrine in particular that it's quite bloated. It's really, really good at what it does. If you have the problem set that doctrine solves, you will not write better code and you will not write more efficient code. The problem set is complicated. The problem set is difficult. If you've loaded up 50, 60 objects out of a database, you've modified eight of them, and then you need to save just those eight back to the database in the correct order so that the uh, foreign keys work, that's a hard problem. Doctrine is really good at that. And I don't write Doctrine, it's not my project, but it is a really well-written project for those sort of problem space. It's good at it. Let's talk about integrating our model into the application. So we've got our entities, we've got our RM, we've got our data mappers, we've got our services. What are we going to do with them? How do we use them in our application? And we have a phrase called the application layer. This is really important. The application layer decouples your business logic from your framework. Depends on the lifetimes of your particular applications as to whether this is important or not. But the key thing you do with an application layer is that you take code out of your controller and you put it in its own class. That gives you two benefits. Firstly, you can test it more easily. Secondly, you can reuse that code outside of the context of your framework. And that can be really helpful. So you've written your application. It's a great web application. And someone tells you you now need to support an iPhone app. So what are you going to do? You're going to write an API. The API needs all the same business logic that your great web app uses. If you've put all the code in the controllers, you've now got to get it out of the controllers and replicate it in your API. Or you put it in the application layer, and then you can have two front ends talking to the same code. If you decide you need a command line, a CLI application, again, you can write a command line application that talks to the same domain model. You have decoupled your business logic, your core value in your application from the particular front-end controllers. And that is really, really powerful because your framework will change over time. I've been programming for a fair old while. I've been doing PHP for a fair old while. The framework I use today is not the same framework that I used 10 years ago. And in 10 years' time, I will not be using the same framework that I'm using today. At least I better not be. Hopefully, we'll get better at this stuff. My core business logic doesn't necessarily change at the same cycle. So make sure that they are decoupled. We can subdivide the application layer into application services and infrastructure services. The application services are all the bits I've talked about so far. So all the bits that make up your application. So for Twitter, it's the ability to send a tweet, display your timeline, stuff like that. That is all their application services, their application layer. In our case, for journeys, it's the ability to create a journey. A customer needs to create a journey. We've got customers, we've got stations, whatever. It's all in our application service. You need to be careful about our services getting too big. It can be quite easy to create fat services in the same way that you can create fat controllers. The way around that is to use the observer pattern to split things up. Subdivide different um, behaviors into their own separate sections and decouple them as best you can. The observer pattern is a really, really good way to decouple service level objects. Then we've got infrastructural services. There's a lot of text there, you don't need to read it. It basically means any code you get from Packagist, to all intents and purposes. The code for sending an email. Who wrote their own email server recently? Who wrote their own email? Oh, there's always one. 
People don't do this anymore. If you need to send an email, use Swift Mailer. Use the built-in mailer that, um, object that's in your framework. Don't write your own mail service now. If you need to, log to log, write an application logger, use Monolog. Don't write your own login framework. That problem has been solved. There is no value to you or your employer or your customer or your user if you write your own login framework. You are wasting everyone's time and money. Don't do it. That's what an infrastructure service is. They are standardized across multiple businesses or multiple applications. They're reusable. Don't write them yourself. It's a waste of time. So to sum up, Ubiquitous language is the way that we ensure that we're all speaking the same words and meaning the same things. It is the hardest bit to do because you have to talk to people. You have to admit that those people over there exist. It's the most valuable bit about getting a model that will last the length of your application well. Bounded contexts are a way of working out which bit of the problem you care about. Entities, value objects, domain services are the way that we organize our source code to be maintainable. Mappers, repositories are the way we store stuff. So when you're Googling for this stuff, you'll hear these terms. Separating out your business logic from your persistence layer is really important. Application services will isolate your domain model from your controllers. Infrastructural services are the bits that you don't want to write yourself. There's an awful lot of separation here. The key thing that I want you to go away with today is that you should separate out your code. It's far more maintainable. At the beginning, it feels like you're spending a lot of time writing the same code. It feels like a lot of repeating code, but it is well worth the effort. My final point is that the success of a design is not marked by its longevity, it's the nature of software to change. If you think you're going to design some software that will never change, you're in the wrong business. Our software always changes. We have to invent strategies to handle that change. Thank you very much. Arkadaşlar sorular için yine bir önceki oturumdaki gibi eğer bu tarafa gelebilirseniz buradan sorabilirseniz sevinirim. Uh, in English, in case you have questions, I'm sure you have. Uh, please, uh, we appreciate if you come uh, right around the, the stand. So, but we don't have long. Better. Very little time. Okay. Hello, thanks for the talk. Uh, you mentioned uh, in the first few slides uh, that sending an email is a part of the model. Did yep. you mean an actual application that focuses on its business on sending emails or the actual event when you have to do something, send an email something? Okay, yeah, so when I say send an email as part of your model, I mean that your application needs to send an email somewhere, not writing emails themselves, but the concept of my email needs to send, my application needs to send a notification. I need to send a lost password email. That's not controller code, it's not view code. Hence, it must be in the model. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so the actual uh, implementation would be in infrastructure. Level. Correct, yes. That's it, exactly. And another one uh, about the applying DDD deliberately. I mean, like, uh, there is no such thing in real applications where you apply it everywhere. For example, in a banking application, you would have something like reporting, for example, and do uh, like building aggregates when you want to generate a report from a bunch of data from a database is a great thing to do. Would you agree to that? Yeah, uh, reporting is a really good example of where not to use an ORM as well. It's part of your application. If you haven't outshopped it, sometimes it's worth just making an infrastructure service and getting someone else to write that code for you. But if you're writing it yourself, that's a really good case where you need a different shape to your model than you do for your actual application, because it feels different. So yeah, you can design that section differently for a reason. What time's the next talk?
Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, one question. In, in Martin Foley says, says in, in his book about uh, software enterprise applications architecture, mm -hmm. that you should sometimes use uh, Active Record to, if, depending on the size of your domain module. And I agree with you that sometimes it's difficult to change. And this is a, 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 well, a challenge in, in software design. Yep. Uh, in your opinion, and what are the tips that you think that we should follow to know when, for example, uh, well, to tackle these kind of problems, to, to tackle in advance the, the design changes in the architecture that we, we should take care of at the beginning or not? This yeah, so it's really difficult, which is why you want to have the maximum flexibility you possibly can. Um, if your project is a short project, a small project, particularly if it's short, if it's not going to be around for a long while, then you can get away with more coupling because you will have less opportunities to maintain it over the long term. You have to be really, really sure that this project that you think is six months is not going to be seven, six years. Um, that happens more frequently than you would believe. But if let, I've written websites that have been designed for, um, for commercial property building. So they're only relevant whilst we're building the property. Once the property is built, the website is now no longer any use. It's not going to take more than a year to build this property, so my website will only ever last a maximum of one year. In that scenario, then Active Record starts looking quite tempting because it's less work. So DDD does cost effort. Decoupling costs effort. And that effort has to be worth your while. And it's not worth your while if you're going to throw this code away very quickly. So it's, that's the thing I would look at. Do we need... This is why and we're running you, late. You mentioned that <laughs> it's, it's not worth to develop your own logging framework. Yeah. But my logging class is just like 100 lines of code. In monolog, it's just 10 dependencies from uh, packages. It's still, you still, it's still worth using monolog over your 100 line but length I mean, of code. It, it takes me less time to code that class than to study monolog. It does at the moment. But what happens when someone says, actually, I need your login framework to send emails, but only in these particular cases? In Monolog, I can make that change like that. How long does it take you to make that change? Monolog is not a monster. There are worse frameworks than that one. But, um, but why don't you just use one of the third-party login frameworks? Uh, login is a really good example of one that you don't want to do yourself. But I appreciate that it seems quite tempting at the beginning, because you literally only need 100 lines of code until it gets complicated. And as your application grows, and especially if you've decoupled your application, then it get, you definitely need better login. Login is one of those areas which gets complicated quickly. Like The minute you split it up into three microservices, now you need an Elk stack. So now you need to start saving to Logstash. How are you going to do that? I just plug in the Logstash adapter into Monolog, and I'm done. It gets, it's back to the flexibility that will be beneficial long term over a long app. But Equally, starting out, I can see your point. It's just easier to drop in a class that's this long that just does a file put contents. But over time, it's just not worth worrying about. It's just not worth the time to maintain that code. If you have to go and edit your, line, your log, login class, rip it out and put monolog in. Or send logger or one of the other login classes. Find one that suits the way you think, but don't waste your time maintaining a login class. You're not adding value to your app. Yet. You don't spend any time yet maintaining it. Anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. <laughs>